Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith, which comes down over 2,000 years from Jesus and the apostles. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, and live your faith with purpose and passion, and even be able to defend it. And sometimes on this channel, we have guests who share their stories. And today we have a wonderful guest, and his name is Andrew Bartell. And we're so excited to have him here today. He is actually a lay Dominican of the province of the most holy name of Jesus, and he lives with his wife and three children in Montana, where he works as a glazier. And Andrew was a lifelong adherent to the Priestly Society of St. Pius X until 2013. And he attended uh, Foyer St. Thomas de Quinn in Avrier, France, which is a boys' academy run by the Dominican community established by Archbishop Marcel himself. And he has come into the uh, Catholic Church, the fullness of the Catholic faith, and he is going to be sharing his testimony and talking about the SSPX and a lot of the problems with the SSPX. Are they in schism? Are they not? What are the, some of the uh, problematic uh, stances that they take and so on? So I want to welcome you to the show, Andrew. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me on, Brian. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Uh, before we even begin, um, you know, some uh, sites are geared toward more traditional topics like this, but um, and while we do cover those topics, a, a lot of our followers might not be familiar with the SSPX. They might not be uh, familiar with what they even are, where they came from, what the problem is between them and Rome, and what the controversy is. So maybe you can give an overview of you know that the kind of the whole thing, why they reject Vatican II, the Pope, the whole thing. Sure. Yes, I certainly can. So the Society of St. Pius X, or the priestly, uh, as it's known, the priestly fraternity of St. Of, of Pius X, was uh, founded by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in 1970 with the approval of, of the local bishop and of Rome. And uh, this, the, what led to the establishment of this priestly fraternity was uh, there were, there was struggle, certain, of course, there was the post conciliar or post council uh, upheaval and confusion. And uh, a lot of seminarians uh, felt that they were not able to pursue their priestly studies uh, in the traditional way or in the way that they wanted to. And uh, of course, there were a lot of, there was a lot of wackiness, you know, that was happening after the council that many people are familiar with, uh, which actually often follows the council when you look at history, but um, we, had, we had, we had, we had our own fair share. And uh, the, so these, these seminarians approached the retired, who was, he was retired at the time and asked him if he would be willing to establish an institute of formation for them. And uh, this, the reason our, the archbishop had earned, earned a bit of a name for himself was that he was one of the council fathers, and he was one of the leaders of uh, what has uh, was unfortunately termed the conservative uh, group uh, at the time of the council. So many people have portrayed uh, it as a conservative and progressive faction, which of course is very unhelpful uh, when it comes to the life of the church to put political terms like that. But there were uh, two groups uh, at the council and the archbishop represented the ones that that wanted um, almost no change uh, and, and was very resistant to a certain ideas that were be, be becoming popularized, both in the liturgical movement and various theological schools of thought. And so he became became known for that uh, at that time. And uh, and so that's why these seminarians approached him and asked him to found this priestly fraternity. So it, all, it got off to a good start. It, it, found, it was founded again with the approval of the bishop and the, the pope. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the archbishop and the people who, who surrounded him and the seminarians were becoming uh, more and more extreme and more and more, uh, what would you say, opposed to the reforms and actually identifying the abuses of the reforms uh, with the authorities themselves, with the church itself. And so they, uh, eventually it culminated in, to, uh, into a, the famous declaration that was made by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in 1976, in which he said that uh, he declared that he rejected 
uh, what he considered the temp the Rome of Protestant and neo-modernist tendencies, and that he was actually adhering to a kind of eternal Rome, the Rome of always. So he believed that the authorities in Rome uh, had actually gone off the rails and were no longer uh, teaching or passing on or implementing the true Catholic faith. And and the uh, of course the the Pope asked him to retract this declaration. Uh, as a matter of fact, Pope Saint Paul VI wrote. The Archbishop three handwritten letters uh, imploring him to make an act of submission and to withdraw his declaration, uh, but that is something that the Archbishop uh, refused to do, and that eventually led to the suppression of the society uh, by the local the local bishop uh, there in Switzerland, uh, as well, which was upheld by uh, Pope Paul the uh, And unfortunately, the Archbishop continued to operate. Anyway, he went on with the ordinations, even though he was of priests, even though he's forbidden to do so, and he was suspended ad divinis uh, and 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 asked to uh, to cease and desist, which again he he refused to do, and uh, so the tensions between Rome and uh, Icon, uh, Icon Switzerland, uh, which was the headquarters of the Society of Saint Pius X, continued to grow. Uh, and they continued uh, to operate again, even though they were had been suppressed and were in a state, all of them, all of the archbishop and all of the priests he was ordaining were all um, suspended. Uh, and it eventually led to a, a breaking point in 1988 when the archbishop declared that he was going to uh, consecrate four bishops uh, against the express will of Pope St. John Paul II. And uh, it was after this that the, the the Pope John Paul, in his letter Ecclesi de Afflicta, declared that the, the this act of consecrating was, in fact, a schismatic act, and that Catholics should uh, have nothing to do with the Society of St. Pius X henceforth, uh, or be, and if they did adhere to this schism, to be subject to the same penalties of excommunication. Uh, and to this day, that declaration, uh, which was also sent by the Congregation of Bishops, uh, by Cardinal Bernard Ganton, to the Archbishop, this declaration of schism has never been lifted to this day. And as a matter of fact, it has been acknowledged uh, as such by all of the subsequent popes, uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, Pope uh, and Pope Francis, uh, most recently in his uh, modu proprio, his letter accompanying his modu proprio Traditionis Custodes, in which he refers to the schism of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and of his movement. So, uh, so you see, that's a bit of a little bit in a nutshell. Of course, there were a lot more, um, a lot more politics that went along into it, a lot more details. Uh, but that's that's the the history of the tensions between Rome and, and Icon in a nutshell. I don't know if everybody will like this, um, what I'm about to say, but it just off the top of my head, it sounds very much, very akin to Martin Luther, who saw a lot of problems in the church. He was concerned about them. He wanted to do something about it, but he went about it the wrong way. He took it to an extreme, to a point where he got in trouble and ended up being excommunicated himself, similar to the archbishop who saw problems in the church. He, wa he, he was concerned, rightly so, about some of the issues in the church, but it seems like he brought it to a problematic extreme. And it's, it seems to me in studying the life of both that he had the very same or very similar hard-headed stubborn uh, stubbornness that Martin Luther had. And Martin Luther would not listen to anybody except himself. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever studied that too, but they just seem similar to me. Yes, there are there are a lot of similarities, and more than just their first and last initials. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so basically, um, what it what it really boils down to is that all uh, disobedience and 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 break with either communion with God or communion with His Church begins with a lack of trust. As the Catechism of the Church teaches us, the first sin of Adam and Eve was a lack of trust in God and in his goodness, and this led to their sin of disobedience, and that all subsequent sin would fit this same pattern. And so what ultimately happened was that the archbishop became so focused on the human side of the church that it, it would seem um, from that, that he... Uh, he actually separated the human and the divine uh, elements of the church or the eternal and temporal, as can be seen from his famous 1976 declaration. Uh, and that's something that you cannot do. 
Uh, you can't, uh, and it's been condemned multiple times by the popes, uh, notably by Pope, uh, he, uh, enumerated by Pope Pius XII in his encyclical on the mystical body of Christ, Mystici Corporis Christi. He points that you cannot separate the, the, the spiritual side of the church or the eternal side of the church from the temporal, especially since the temporal and the human side of the church uh, is capable, it's imperfect. It's capable of sinning, of, of, of having lots of sinners. Uh, I mean, think Jesus chose Judas, right? Judas was one of the first uh, bishops, one of the first ones who made a sacrilegious communion, right? The, and the one of the ones who betrayed Christ for money. Uh, and and But we don't leave the church. We don't leave Christ because of Judas. And, and that's what the fundamental error was. Uh, was this this mistake of losing trust because there at the time at around 1988 uh, it was Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger who would eventually become Pope Benedict the 16th who uh, was in charge of trying to heal the heal this this division this uh, this uh, rapidly moving trajectory toward division and eventually and they drew up an agreement in which uh, the the archbishop would accept the entirety of the Second Vatican Council interpreted in light of the tradition, uh, the validity of the new rite of mass and the other reforms. Uh, and, and in exchange, he was going to be given a bishop for his society, and the society would once again be recognized by the church. And he actually signed that agreement uh, with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, but he reneged his sig signature the next morning and then declared that he was going to go forward uh, with because he believed he believed that the Roman authorities were just waiting for him to die. He believed that they were playing a game with him, and he didn't trust that they were actually going to get him a, give him a bishop. So you see, he he wasn't putting the future of his society in the hands of God and saying, if this is God's work, God will support me. God will give me th this bishop. God, but instead, he took things into his own hands and said, I providence has entrusted this to me, and I have to see it through. Uh, and it's very interesting that he wasn't willing to eight, uh, to wait for that one bishop, that it wasn't enough. He wanted four bishops, and that one was enough, and that he wasn't willing to wait and see uh, what God had in store or that whether or not God would be faithful or not to his priestly society. And uh, in in the, the dialogues of St. Catherine of Siena in her section on obedience, uh, God, the Eternal Father, reveals to St. Catherine that the sign that you have obedience or not is patience. If you do not have patience, that means you do not have true obedience. Mm -hmm. That patience is the the sign of having true obedience. And you can so you can see right here with this break that then happened in 1988 was a total lack of patience, a total lack of trust that God would provide for the SSPX if it was indeed the work of God. So just to be clear, um <laughs> this is kind of a big controversy and a big debate, but um so the SSPX are in fact in schism and they are not part of the Catholic Church in a sense. I mean, some people will say they're not in schism. Others will say they're in partial communion. Um, there's many. Why did the SSPX and other uh, adherents say there's no schism or, you know, they they are in communion or partial communion? And why does the church say that they are in schism? It's yes. kind of a, you see, they have both sides going on. That's right. Yes. So what, what happened was, of course, is that the society came up with a false definition of schism uh, because it's very easy. It's a fine line between her the, the schism, which is the rejection of the authority of the sovereign pontiff and refusing communion with those subject to him. And then heresy uh, with regards to papal primacy or papal infallibility, which is a rejection of the, the dogma of the papacy itself. Right. Uh, and so, of course, if you if you withdraw from authority, the chances are you don't fully believe or you at least have a practical rejection or repudiation of the authority of the Pope, as it was expressed in, in Vatican I and earlier. Uh, or if you reject the authority of the Pope in principle and, and as the doctrine, you're probably going to withdraw from submission to him as well. So the two go hand in hand. And St. Thomas Aquinas, following St. Augustine and St. Jerome, says that heresy uh, is usually followed by a break with the church, a schism, and schism usually fabricates a heresy to justify its separation from the church. So these two often go hand in hand. And so what the, the, the Society of St. Pius X says is we don't reject the Pope. 
we accept the authority of the Pope in principle, uh, and we pray for him in the Mass, and we uh, commemorate him in the Mass, and we, uh, and you know, all of these different things we, we do. But, uh, but you see that <laughs> just because they don't reject uh, the Pope, the person of the Pope, and they say he has a, his authority in principle, they still, comp- he, he does, he has no role in the, the in the governance of the society, in the common faith, because they reject uh, the developments that happened at the Second Vatican Council, and they reject the reforms that followed them, uh, even going so far as to reject the new rite of mass as evil and harmful to your faith and sinful to attend. And uh, they also uh, have continued to withdraw obedience. They set up their own canonical courts. Uh, they make their own decisions with regards to liturgy and, and governance. So they, in, in practice, they live a separate life from the Pope and they only listen, or they only interact with local bishops, which again is a part of the extension of the Pope's authority, as well as having their own apostolic authority as bishops. So that in itself is also part of the horizontal aspect of schism that they're offending against, refusal to interact with local bishops, actually coming in to their dioceses and setting up rival altars, rival chapels. Um, and then also refusing to worship with other Catholics according to approved rites. That's a refusal of communion with regards to worship. Um, so you see there, there's a there's an offense on the horizontal level as well as the vertical level of, of not of refusing submission to the Roman pontiff. And just so we can clarify this, uh, let me read uh, this brief quote from uh, a treatise that was written by a canonist. Uh, Father Ignatius Zal, it, it's entitled The Communication of Catholics with Schismatics. And he gives a definition in here. And this is the classic definition. And it shows that the society has, again, found refuge in ambiguity and confusion in order to, um, to try to justify their position and to defend themselves from the, 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 um, the charge of schism. But he says here uh, that schism... Uh, is one or a schismatic is one who has received baptism and still retains the name of Christian and nevertheless refuses obedience to the Supreme Pontiff or refuses to communicate with those members of the church who are subject to him. There is here involved no denial of any article of divine or Catholic faith. Strictly considered, a schismatic professes belief in the sovereign power and primacy of the Pope, but out of malice refuses to be subject to him and to obey him as head of the church and the vicar of Christ on earth. Such schism is called pure schism. And again, so remember we were talking about there's also mixed schism, which is more common, which usually is accompanied by a heresy. Um, But right now we're just talking about schism, right? So then he goes on to give these criteria. So to constitute the delect of schism in the strict sense, the following conditions are required. One, one must withdraw directly, expressly, or indirectly by means of one's actions from obedience to the Roman pontiff and separate oneself from ecclesiastical communion with the rest of the faithful, even though one does not join a separate schismatical set. And the withdrawal must be made in relation to those things by which the unity of the church are constituted, which again is faith, uh, worship, and governance. Uh, So you see um, that he says right here that it is not necessary in order uh, to be a schismatic, in order to be guilty of schism, to reject the authority of the Pope in principle. That is that is not necessary because the Pope has two primacies as defined in Vatican I. He has a primacy of truth, a primacy of faith in his teaching authority, and that's of infallibility is the corollary to that that primacy. And then he also has a primacy of charity, right? A primacy of love. And that has to do with the regulation of worship in the church, as well as the practical governance. And papal primacy is a dogma. It is a dogma that no Catholic can reject without endangerment to faith and salvation. Uh, And that is, again, separate from infallibility, separate from the exercise of infallibility. Infallibility and indefectibility are the protections that enable us to be able to submit to these twofold primacies, the primacy of faith, which is the submission of our intellect, and the primacy of love, which is the submission to our, our will. This is Roman Catholicism, and, and, and you cannot reject it, but the society in principle have, and this is why they have had, they've had to come up and fabricate a false definition of schism, which does not actually fit the classic definition. 
And it doesn't agree with the church's definition. Like they That's almost. Right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And the church has actually used multiple times um, the, the word schism from the very beginning. There was that official declaration, like I brought up, Ecclesia de Afflicta uh, by Pope St. John Paul II. Um, and he says here, quote, in itself, this act was one of disobedience to the Roman pontiff in a very grave matter and supreme importance for the unity of the church, such as the ordination of bishops, whereby apostolic succession is sacramentally perpetuated. Hence, such disobedience, which implies in practice the rejection of the Roman primacy, constitutes a schismatic act. In the present circumstances, I wish especially to make an appeal, both solemn and heartfelt, paternal and fraternal, to all those who until now have been linked in various ways to the movement of Archbishop Lefebvre, that they may fulfill the grave duty of remaining united to the Vicar of Christ in the unity of the Catholic Church and of ceasing their support in any way for the movement. Everyone should be aware that formal adherence to the schism is a grave offense against God and carries the penalty of excommunication decreed by the Church's law close quote. So you see, it's very clear. And this declaration has never been rescinded. As a matter of fact, this society's schismatic stance has been confirmed by both Pope Benedict XVI in his letter accompanying Samorum Pontificum, as well as Pope Francis in his letter accompanying Traditionis Custodes. I also was thinking of uh, Pope Benedict's motto proprio as well, um, when he was talking about how they were excommunicated. And he says that, and even today, he says the doctrinal questions remain, and until they are clarified within the society, they have no canonical status in the church, and their ministers cannot legitimately exercise any ministry. And he goes on to say, they yes. basically, they have no active ministry, and until they fix their heresies and refusal to submit to Rome, it's always going to be that way. That's I right. Mean, that seems pretty, pretty clear to me. That was yes. the most last authoritative statement on the matter, and nothing has changed as far as I know. I mean, some no. people say that you know, uh, Pope Francis, you know, gave them, you know, faculties or uh, sacraments and has allowed them to practice and such. So some people think, well, maybe he's changed that, you know, maybe he's reversed that and said it's okay for the SSPX to be doing what they're doing. Is is that accurate? I mean, is there truth to that? No, it's it's not accurate. As a matter of fact, it goes completely contrary to what Pope Francis himself said in his apostolic letter, Misericordia et Misera. Uh, in which he he explicitly states that this is a gesture of mercy, similar to the lifting of the excommunication, which is meant to draw back the the priests and bishops and adherents of the SSPX back into full communion of the church. He explicitly states, as a matter of fact, why don't I read it so people can uh, can hear it? So Pope Francis, again, this is Misericordia at Misera. He says, quote, for the pastoral benefit of these faithful and trusting the goodwill of the priests of the SSPX to strive with God's help for the recovery of full communion with the Catholic Church, I have personally decided to extend this faculty beyond the Jubilee year, close quote. So, so you see, again, this gesture was an act of mercy. It's an act of grace. And the church has a history of allowing this. And having faculties uh, does not itself uh, mean that there is no schism. Uh, and the Orthodox are a perfect example of this. They exactly. have faculties to be able to witness marriages and hear confessions, but they are still in schism. And I would also argue that a large portion of the German church and hierarchy is also in schism mm -hmm. uh, with the, the Pope, even though they still retain these faculties at the moment for the time being. So having faculties, and, and, and here's another example that I like to give people uh, that, that shows that the extension of faculties for the good of souls by the church is actually not something that's novel. Uh, and is, it is also not a reflection on the status of the one who is given the faculties. So it's classic uh, Catholic uh, teaching in, in, the, in canon law that a priest who has even been defrocked and suspended is allowed to offer the sacraments of uh, uh, of the extreme unction and to exercise that ministry and to hear the confession of a dying person uh, in the name of the church. And that, that extension of that faculty, again, is for the good of that soul, but it does not reflect on the status of that priest because, again, he has been defrocked. He, he might not even profess the, the true faith anymore. Um, so you see there's a precedent for this. 
Exactly. And I remember Pope Francis, when he was talking about this, when this whole thing first came up, I remember Pope Francis specifically said that this does not change anything. This does not change the status of the society. And that's clear. And yet, I hear all the time, oh, well, Pope Francis did this, Pope Francis. These people are attacking Pope Francis 24-7, and then all of a sudden, it's convenient for them to you know, <laughs> use Pope Francis. as, yeah. From their view, has he ever said anything right? And now, oh, well, he's he's infallible yeah. in this. You know, it's, 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 it's kind no, of funny. It's, it's classic picking and choosing of, of what they want to hear. They, they, they take what they want to hear, but then they reject anything that they don't want to. And Pope Francis himself has acknowledged that it was a schism. And again, like I said, in his letter accompanying Traditionis Custodes, he said, quote, the faculty to use the 1962 missile granted by the indult of the Congregation for Divine Worship in 1984 and confirmed by St. John Paul II in the Motu Proprio Ecclesia Dei in 1988 was above all motivated by the desire to foster the healing of the schism with the movement of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, close quote. So you see, he's still upholding the declaration of schism. Uh, that was made by Pope St. John Paul II. Nothing has changed. This, this, this declaration of schism has never been abrogated or rescinded. And I would challenge anyone to present to me any kind of official documentation uh, proving otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, the SSPX kind of have the same problem that City Vacantis do in the sense that, you know, they know better than the church. They have all their own reasons for knowing everything. And even though they hate each other and strongly condemn each other, um, and they have both very good reasons for doing so. I think the best arguments come from each of them about why each of them are wrong. But you had mentioned canon law and, um, you know, it's very interesting that they try, oh, well, you know, Taylor Marshall does this all the time. Like, oh, well, canon law says this and canon law says you're not the interpreter of canon law, Mr. Marshall, and neither are the SSPX. Mm -hmm. If you try to supersede the authority of the church on canon law, you just can't do it. The church is the yeah. final authority. And they they quote that. Yes, that's right. And, and, and it's actually in canon law that the Pope is the supreme interpreter and legislator of the laws themselves. Exactly. As a matter of fact, all of their authorities flow from his uh, his own ultimate and apostolic authority, and and so if your interpretation of the law differs with the Pope, guess who wins in the end, right? Uh, so uh, the, it's just again they try to find refuge in the in, in the intricacy and uh, um, and ambiguities of canon law in order to try to make their case. I mean, it's very it's like the classic Philadelphia lawyer, you know, approach of, of trying to create muddy the waters and create confusion. Uh, so that it's and that's one of the reasons why I, to, to this day, people are so confused about the status of the Society of St. Pius X is because of the lies and falsehoods that they have concocted in order to distance themselves from the accusation. And now they have a champion on their side, if I may say so, and that is Taylor Marshall. And uh, I feel like he's bringing a lot of confusion into the church. I think he's bringing a lot of hurt and oh, I don't want to use the word necessarily destruction, but kind of uh, into the church and he's confusing people and he is not being honest. And it seems I, I've heard rumors that he's uh, joined the SSBX. I haven't been able to verify that. I don't know if you know that, but um what would you say about the controversy re regarding Taylor Marshall? Um, you know, and promote, he prom constantly promotes the SSPX now. He's constantly promoting SSPX priests on his show where they say, you know, oh, well, canon law says this. Oh, well, the church is wrong about this. <laughs> and, uh, and he's, he's basically, almost proving the fact that they're they're not they are in schism because they're refusing to accept the pope they're constantly railing against him they don't accept vatican ii and they don't accept the authority so i mean what's different about them and the orthodox and martin luther i i don't see the difference or no. city vacantis for that matter the historical precedent is i mean it lines up perfectly with what with what they're doing the you look at the arguments that martin luther and the orthodox made against the 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 roman church and they're almost identical. There's just a few details that have changed. Uh, even the words are, are uncannily sometimes almost verbatim. Uh, and so this is, this is a, a seriously big problem. And uh, I, Taylor Marshall's large following is definitely a reason for concern. And to me, it indicates a lot of people like to say, well, you know, that Taylor Marshall doesn't represent uh, so many traditionalists. Uh, it may, that's just a really vocal minority. Then why are so many people following him? 
why why is his name always being brought up when I go to these the Catholic conference you know conferences on the liturgy or all the everybody that I'm constantly encountering they're bringing up these names Taylor Marshall Anthanasius Schneider you know uh, uh, Kennedy Hall all these all these different apologists for the SSPX uh, why are there so many people why do they have so many followers and why are so many people listening to them. Uh, it's a serious problem, which is why, you know, people like myself and John Salza and, and Dom Damaso with the Logos Project have been trying to raise awareness to dispel a lot of this confusion and the lies that are being spread about the Society of St. Pius X uh, and to bring clarity to the situation. Because currently we're seeing it go, it continue to grow and go down this destructive path that will eventually make this schism permanent. And that would be such a great tragedy for uh, the Catholic Church. But another another thing that many people um, uh, don't realize is that there's a fault. The the Archbishop, uh, the Archbishop, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and the SSPX have been rebuked by the popes multiple times for a false notion of tradition uh, because they have this notion of tradition, which is uh, that uh, tradition is the measuring stick. It's, you know, the rule of faith and that I as a Catholic can hold that measuring stick up to uh, the Pope or the, you know, the bishops or to a council and measure them with that stick and my understanding of tradition and say, I can reject it. And that, that is the same kind of uh, false, um, what would you call it? A structure uh, or balance in the rules of faith uh, that, that leads people like Martin Luther or the Orthodox to say, I can look at scriptures and judge the church or judge the Pope, or I can look at tradition and judge the Pope or judge the church. It's the same kind of criteria, but it's one that's inconsistent with the, with, with the tradition of the church and with the scriptures itself, because nowhere in the scriptures does it say that tradition is the pillar and foundation of truth. Nowhere does it say <laughs> the Bible is the pillar and foundation of truth. No. In 1 Timothy 3.15, it says the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. Right. Because the Bible and this tradition flowed from the heart of the church. The church was there first. The church was established by Jesus Christ. And the, the, the deposit of faith flows out of the heart of the church and derive their authority from her authority. And, and that's why St. Augustine said that I would, he said, quote, I will, would not believe the gospels themselves if the authority of the church did not move me to do so. Close quote. Right. Like he said that because he realized that that's what the authority rests on is this authority of this living uh, uh, church that has been given the mission uh, by God. There's this progression of the mission of the father and the father sends his son and the son sends the apostles and the apostles send their successors so that this divine mission, which is a part of the divine law and divine nature of God, actually uh, extends in, in through time and space. Uh, in the person of the church. And if you don't have that authority, and if that authority is not divine, Roman Catholicism is a fraud. Roman Catholicism is a joke, and so is all of Christianity. If you do not have, and that's, that, is, that is what is so, um, uh, that's, that's what's so dangerous about these errors, such as traditionalism, this extreme traditionalist movement, is that if they are right, if they are right about the Second Vatican Council, about the complete corruption of the church, about the church being able to uh, promulgate, to fail in one of her essential roles in the teaching of the universal church, in the uh, giving of the worship of a universal mode of worship that would be harmful to souls. Uh, if, if they are right, then that means that Christianity is wrong. There's no authority, right? You might as well give up the Christian experiment because that means the church has failed that Christ has been unfaithful in his promise that he would not allow the gates of hell to prevail against his church and that he would be with the church always until the end of time. It would turn Jesus Christ into a liar. And that's the gravity of the situation. That's why it's, we, we have to, we have, it's so important that we, we raise awareness about, um, about the, these errors that are being spread because it cuts to the heart of Christianity itself. And what does Taylor Marshall and, you know, SSPX have on their side? And what do we have on our side? I mean, we have the express, unambiguous teachings, authoritative teachings of the Pope, um, condemnations, excommunications. We have um, 
we have a canon law. You know, we have all of these things where they have to reinterpret, reapply, try to figure out how to get around these things. Oh, well, it doesn't mean this or it doesn't mean that. Or, yes. you know, and it seems to me that, you know, Taylor Marshall, I mean, it, in addition to having a lot of inaccuracies and a lot of actually just errors and things he says about councils and, you know, Catholic things, you know, he's trying to really find every way around this when the Catholic Church, in my opinion, has been so clear about it. Yes, it, it, it certainly has. And it's very unfortunate that lies are being spread, especially by him and, and by other apologists, uh, such as uh, Kennedy Hall at the Kennedy Report. Uh, he is repeatedly spreading this lie that you can't find uh, condemnations of the SSPX in any documents. There's no documents that show that the SSPX is in schism or condemnation. And I'm just sitting here going, this is someone who has is, is fully adhering. Uh, he's embraced the leadership of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. He's adhering to the SSPX. As a matter of fact, he's uh, joining their third order. And yet, has he not read all of the writing that has over the last four decades that of the SSPX defending themselves against the charges uh, from the popes of suppression, excommunication, suspension, schism. Why, why does he refuse to acknowledge what the Society of St. Pius X itself acknowledges and spend so much time and effort trying to rebut? So, so this idea that the church has not condemned the SSPX uh, as a schism and as uh, a, a non-Catholic entity is a lie. It is completely false and it's being peddled by, but it's continuously being spread and peddled by its apologists. And I'll be honest with you, Andrew, you know, I'm actually concerned for Archbishop uh, Marcel's um, soul. <laughs> I don't know if he reconciled before he died or not, but you know, the, his, he, he had the heart of Martin Luther 100%. I've studied both of their lives and they both were just so stubborn. And I feel like the church bent over backwards. I mean, Pope John Paul bent over backwards to try to bring them back. Pope Benedict gave them everything they wanted practically. And they still, like you said, they signed it. They said yes. And then he got all these, you know, fearful conspiracies in his head and said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And, you know, there was just no, it's, and honestly, do we want them back in the church? Do we want them? Of course, in, in one sense, yes, you do. But on the other sense, are they just going to leave again when they don't like something? The problem is at the heart. It's yeah. obedience. And until that's, right. that's fixed, it's a huge problem. Yeah, there has to be a change of heart. And uh, and unfortunately, there is an, a false notion of obedience that is being uh, peddled by the SSPX and is now even being peddled in the church uh, by, by prominent people who call themselves traditional Catholics. Uh, most notably Peter Kwas uh, Kwasniewski, um, who has actually written a tract uh, called True Obedience in the Church. And this tract is available from Sophia Institute Press for free to seminarians and priests. And in it, he, he gives a justification for being able uh, to disobey uh, the, the, the ways that you can disobey, uh, especially with regards to the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, and its suppression on the diocesan level. So they're, they're trying to get out of obedience and they're trying. And, and so you see he's bought into these same arguments that were presented by the SSPX and by the Archbishop Lefebvre. And it's now becoming mainstream. Right. And and this is this is the danger, again, is that these errors of of, of it's this Protestantism. Movement, yeah. Is, is actually spreading into the church itself. So it is very it is very dangerous. Uh, and there does have to definitely be a conversion of heart, which is why, again, the, 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 the Society of St. Pius X has no canonical status in the church today, right? right? And, and many people say they're not in schism, they're just irregular canonical st status, right? Uh, and a regular, schiz a regular canonical status means no canonical status, which means it is a non-Catholic entity. It is not subject to the church's laws, nor does it act, nor does its leadership or its members act uh, in, a, in, a, in an attitude of submission to the authority of the church. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that uh, obedience issue, if you don't mind. Um, Certainly. Because obviously, they have their objections. Um, you know, the Novus Ordo Mass, which is, you know, for most anyone who doesn't know, is the non-Latin Mass in traditional, you know, language, in our language, English. Um, 
you know, the Novus Ordo Mass, the English Mass has been Protestant uh, Protestantized. Um, you know, Vatican II has several heresies, inclu including uh, ecumenism. Uh, I mean, I could list an, a, a number of things. So, you know, we're actually holding, they'll say, to the true Catholic faith and, yes. you know, the true traditions of the church where the Latin Mass can never be removed or, you know, or even apparently... Uh, like changed or you know you know even tweaked at all but um so they'll say you know we're being obedient to god first you know we're not being obedient to the people who are changing god's laws and you know then whole nova sordo sect i mean i don't know if all i don't think all sspx people hold to this but a lot of them seemingly just reject the nova sordo most of them do if, if you're if you're attending the sspx exclusively you buy into it so yes if, if you're an adherent of the sspx you do believe that it is a false it's a false church right it's the counter church it's the conciliar church and uh and i isn't know isn't that well, schism in itself yes uh, it certainly is saying that there are two different churches yeah th there's a few quotes that i've i've shared elsewhere on the the logos project on our video that we we did called schism of the century uh but here's here's just a couple of them um this was archbishop lefebvre um in july july 29th 1976 quote to whatever extent pope bishops priests or faithful adhere to this new church they separate themselves from the catholic church close quote uh, and again, his, his famous 1974 declaration that I uh, referenced earlier, quote, we refuse and have always refused to follow the Rome of the neo-Protestant trend clearly manifest through Vatican II and later in all the reforms of it, close quote. And then um, not only Archbishop, but he, all of his followers as well. So you have a letter to Cardinal Ganton uh, and this, this open letter by 24 SSPX superiors uh, was in response to the official decree of, of, uh, of excommunication and schism. And they wrote a letter, an open letter to him. So this is the leadership of the Society of St. Pius X. Quote, to be publicly associated with the sanction of excommunication would be a mark of honor and a sign of orthodoxy before the faithful who have a strict right to know that the priests they approach are not in communion with a counterfeit church. Close quote. So, and, and these quotes can be said over and over again. Some, some SSPX apologists like to dismiss them as hyperbole. Um, then if it's just hyperbole, why did he act on it? His actions show that it's not just hyperbole. It's actually an insult to Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre to say that he did not mean these things. Yes, he meant these things. Uh, he, and uh, so, but you can see there clearly uh, there are these two churches. So even if the uh, term conciliar church originated with some cardinal uh, or bishop somewhere and the, uh, the archbishop uh, appropriated it, um, he eventually came to mean that term. And so did his followers to mean the authorities in Rome, to mean the pope, to mean and, and the bishops and every single person, like he said, any and to whatever extent pope bishops priests or faithful adhere to this new church they separate themselves from the catholic church all these reforms so those of not only those of us those who are implementing the reforms so that would include the pope all of the bishops of the world all of the priests on all of the 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 the, the local parish level and those of us who accept it we now belong to this new church there's no other conclusion so you can see right there, the schismatic attitude. And, and these are the same kinds of quotes that, again, uh, Marcel, uh, um, Martin Luther made, right? Uh, like you were saying, true obedience. What, are, what is true obedience? What is false obedience? Martin Luther said, I have to be faithful to God rather than be faithful to man. It's exactly the same right. Quote, right. But the problem with that, of course, is that that is a Protestant ecclesiology. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, or and ecclesiology means teaching on the church, right? Nature of the church, constitution of the church. That is fundamentally Protestant uh, because it associates the true church with the true believers instead of the actual institution of the church, right? How does, if, if uh, how, how, unless you have a direct link to God, like Christ or the apostles or uh, Moses, for example, in the Old Testament, where you have a one-on-one, -on -one, how how else are you going to have an interaction with the authority of God, right? Because the the uh, the authority of God, since uh, the the God Christ ascended into heaven and left His church here, and the and the apostles appointed their successors, we 
uh, are subject to Christ's authority under the apostles, right? Under And their successors. That is actually the authority of Christ. Why else would they have that authority? And you find this in the words of Christ himself. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me, right? So the, Christ exercises his authority through these, these men. So the rejection of the, of the apostolic authority, either of the Pope or of the Bishop, is in fact a rejection of the authority of Christ, of the authority of God. And this is still the stance of the SSPX today, because it sounds to me, basically on what you just said, that he rejected uh, the Pope and he rejected uh, the church and he rejected Vatican II and pretty much everything that the Catholic Church teaches today, he said, you must reject or you're in a counterfeit church, but yet right. they're faithful to the Pope. Right. I know it's it's an absurd situation. And and that's why in the recent debate, I don't know if you saw that debate on uh, Matt Frad's channel, uh, Pints of the Coyness, between um, Jeff Kassman and the uh, Diamond brother, uh, Peter Diamond, who's a uh, oh, infamous, yes. infamous state of a contest, uh, yep. most holy family monastery. Uh, it was a complete it was a complete train wreck. And, and I had a hunch that it would be. And uh, I and I and I'm actually very grateful that Matt, even though he got a lot of flack from him, I'm very glad Matt uh, Frad held that debate because it showed that the recognize and resist position, the position of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, which was represented by Jeff Kassman, uh, was actually they didn't have a leg to stand on because when the state of a contest, um, quote unquote, brother, you know, Benedictine brother uh, said, can you tell me, tell me? Does Pope Francis profess the true faith? He couldn't answer. He could not answer. And that w- it was from that moment on that uh, the, really he lost the debate because he could not answer that the Pope of the Catholic Church had the true faith. Uh, and, 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 and so there's this confusion. And, and the, the, the St. Vicontis pointed over and over again. He said, my opponents, a hero, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, rejected heresies of the Second Vatican Council, rejected the new mass as, as, as sinful and harmful to the faith, right? So they don't have a leg to stand on. And St. Vicontism is a more consistent uh, position than that, because even though they have their own problems with ecclesiology when it comes to the visibility of the church and the perpetuity of the uh, institution uh, and the apostolic nature of the church. It's funny for a guy who is really obsessed with heresy, brother Peter Diamond, right? That everybody's heretical except them, right? That's right. Uh, And uh, for someone who's obsessed with heresy, he actually promoted a heresy um, by admitting that uh, he did not know and he did not believe that there was any uh, bishop uh, who actually had the true faith, that there was no one uh, who actually exercises ordinary Um, jurisdiction, ordinary power, this power of Christ that was supposed to be with us to the end of time, right? That is a heresy. To say there are no apostolic sees exercising the authority of Christ, that's a heresy, right? So you see how these guys are actually falling into heresy themselves. But it was amazing that the debate actually exposed both sides. And this is one of the things that led me um, uh, it was through my study of state of occultism and my study of the recognize and resist position that I realized they only have, they both only have a slice of the pie. Yeah. The full pie can only be found in the Roman Catholic Church. And I said that at the beginning of the show, and I'll say it again, and I've said it a hundred times that pro, um, SSBX have the best arguments against Sede Vicantis and totally, in my opinion, destroy that position. But the SSPX have gr- like the best arguments against SP- SSPX and yeah. destroy the SSPX position. And neither one of them can see it. You know, no. like it's just yeah. it's and, no one can and, see the disobedience going on on both and sides. And of course, what they both and what they both conveniently ignore is the teaching on on divine mission. And canonical mission is closely connected uh, to this divine mission. And Saint Francis de Sales in his Catholic Controversy talks about this uh, in section one, uh, which I recommend to everyone. Like the 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 Catholic Contri- Controversy by Saint Francis de Sales. If you're going to get one book on Catholic apologetics. It's that one. So and good. It's, it's incredible because first, before he says, before I get any of these issues of the reformers, before I get into any of these issues, um, such as sola scriptura, sola fide, any of these things, um, I'm going to, I'm going to knock the, 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 show you that you don't even have a leg to stand on. You go, show me how you reformers, Calvin or Luther have any kind of either immediate or immediate mission because God from the beginning of time in the Jewish people and then in the Christian uh, church 
have has always sent uh, you have always had had the necessity of both of these uh and the the immediate immediate mission is direct uh, I, I should start with immediate mission immediate mission is direct sending by god right direct communication with god that would be somebody like moses christ the apostles and then you have immediate mission, which is the sending of someone who has immediate mission. So the sending of Joshua by Moses in the Old Testament, or the sending of uh, the, uh, the the successors of the apostles, right? The, the bishops, Titus, um, all, all of, all of the, the men who would eventually become uh, the bishops of the Catholic Church. That's immediate mission. And you have to have both in order to be able to lay any kind of claim of speaking with God's authority or, or any lay any claim to being the true church of Christ. And it's something no traditionalist, either state of a contest or Lefebvist can offer. Um, and, and which is why there's complete silence about this subject, uh, or, or they brush it off, um, as silly, uh, as well as uh, Protestantism, um, and, and the Orthodox, right? You have this lack of, of divine mission. And you can't have that lack because it's actually a part of the divine nature itself. It actually cuts at the heart of divine nature. It's not just human law because they all, you know, the SS, the proponents of the SSPX always say we have to obey God's law rather than human law. Well, this mission, this idea of divine mission, this doctrine of divine mission is divine law and is something which they completely reject and operate outside of. Yeah. And, uh, I've studied, I've done apologetics for decades now, and I've talked to every religion. I've evangelized pastors, street evangelization. I've done, I've done it all. And, uh, the same Protestant arguments are being made by the SSPX in like to a T, um, you know, the self autonomy and it's all about what I feel and my conscience and, you know, God's, it gets even worse with say David Contes who, you know, can't, have no way of electing a valid pope and they have to resort to well we think that virgin mary might come down and do it they're just <laughs> going to engage in conspiracy theories at that yeah. point but um you know i was reading on uh the website today on uh one peter five website which has become an uh cough interesting website and they had a statement on there on your debate with Casman, and they said that um i don't have it here but it said that the the, according to the magisterium of the church, anyone at any time for any reason can go to an SSPX church to receive communion, which seems to be, you know, the kind of um, theology that Taylor Marshall's pushing now. Is is that accurate? Is that quote from the magisterium? Does the Catholic Church no. teach that? No, it's it's not. And 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 I, I like how they they like to say the church says this or the Pope says this, and then they don't give anything to back it up. So this. This lie it was actually uh, part of a confusion and a misunderstood private letter from a um, from the uh, from a monsignor uh, to to another to a certain individual, and this monsignor, I believe it was Monsignor Pearl, actually came out later the next year and clarified that that was not what he meant that that any that it was perfectly fine to go to the mass of the SPX and there's no problem there whatsoever right um so the the same principles that would allow a catholic to say go to an orthodox mass um are the same principles that are often applied uh to um to going to an SSPX mass right so so the idea that you could fulfill your sunday obligation according to the divine law Right. Let's say you are completely impeded from going to a mass in good standing, um, just like you could stay at home and pray a rosary. Uh, so going to mass could fulfill, you might say, that divine law of trying to make holy this uh, the Sabbath day, but it does not fulfill the the church's law, uh, the church's explicit law of having to go to a mass in uh, communion with the local bishop and which with the pope, and it's only in that. A situation that you were actually able to fulfill your Sunday obligation. So that was the clarification that the same person that they rely on 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 this on the authority for this actually came out and contradicted it. And John Salza, if you go to John Salza's art, uh, website, True or False Pope, he has multiple art articles, and and he actually goes through all of the different uh, statements that have been made on this subject and clarifies it. And that's why. And and he had this debate over on One Peter Five on the SSPX debate series. And every apologist that came forward to try to come up against him fell flat. And he made them look like such fools that 
they, they said, well, we're just going to shut it down. We, we don't believe what you, you know, we don't, we don't think you have the correct position. So we're, you're not writing for us anymore. You're not going to write this, what they believe was nonsense about not being able to attend or fulfill your Sunday obligation at the masses of the SSPX. But here's just a brief quote for people, but I, I recommend people go and read that article. But the quote, let's see here. Um, uh, where is it? Here it is. So from, and again, this is from his reply. So John Saul's reply to Father John Zolsdorf, Father Z. Many people may be familiar with Father Z. Uh, he oh, says, yes. Quote, yep. He says, quote, the sole private letter of Monsignor Pearl in 2002 only appears to conf conf conflict with the public replies of the commission that were issued in 1988, 1995, 2002, 2012, and 2015, which reiterate the conclusion that SSPX masses do not fulfill the Sunday obligation. However, Pearl himself actually eliminated the apparent con contradiction by issuing a public reply the very next year, 2003, clarifying that his 2002 private reply was taken out of context and that the SSPX masses remain forbidden, close quote. So, you know, you just, you can see that they're, 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 they're using, they're grasping at straws. They're trying to use everything that they possibly can to appear normal, to appear like they are in good standing. But the reality is that the SSPX is not Catholic. And yet we have, I hate to bring it up again, but Taylor Marshall has our, over and over again, he says, we can go to an SSPX church. Why, how can he say that with these clear statements? Yes. Well, again, it's similar to how they try to weasel out of the 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 um, uh, the explicit statements of suppression of the Society of St. Pius X, of suspension of divinis, of excommunication, uh, even though those the 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 excommunications were lifted um, uh, by Pope Benedict as a gesture of mercy. Uh, he still indicated that the bishops still need to re still needed to reconcile. So we have to not confuse the penalty of excommunication with the sin and crime of schism itself. So the schism still remains, even if, and as a matter of fact, if you continue in your commitment to schismatic actions and positions, the ipso facto undeclared excommunication actually then takes effect. Um, rendering, you know, the, so it's very similar to the mutual lifting of the excommunications in 1965 by the patriarch uh, Ath Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI, uh, in which they both came together and mutually lifted the excommunications. That did not end the East-West schism, um, but it was a gesture of reconciliation and of mercy to try to draw closer and to work toward Christian unity. The gesture of the lifting of the excommunication towards the four bishops and notice the bishops, the, the excommunications were not lifted uh, from the two bishops that had died in a state of excommunication, who were the co-consecrators, Lefebvre and Castor de Meyer. Uh, but, yeah, but the four bishops, uh, the four bishops um, that they were and as a gesture of, of, of hope, hopeful, hoping for unity, because at the time there were dialogues going on between Pope Benedict and the society, and there was a hope, hopeful reconciliation. And uh, but but that's something that never actually uh, took effect because of the internal division uh, and strife that happened uh, up until the year 2012, which was actually the time that I left, in which the Society of Saint Pius X experienced the biggest split in its history, losing one of its bishops and and dozens of its priests and actually whole religious communities that then left them. Wow. Yeah, and I remember uh, Pope Benedict specifically says this doesn't change your status. <laughs> Even though we lift the uh, excommunications, it doesn't change anything. You know, you still need to be reconciled. So I yes. think that's really, yeah. really important to know uh, for people. Oh, yes. And, and one more thing, I, I want to bring up this point because it's one that's very, that's very, very important. The, the existence of the Fraternity of St. Peter, which was started by priests of the SSPX who left in 1988, um, that they started that they actually went along with the agreement that Archbishop Lefebvre accepted and then reneged on. So those priests who left to found the fraternity are the ones who were ex who they were they were former SSX priests who then left, and their existence along with the existence of the Institute of Christ the, T the King um, and other um, uh, societies uh, priestly societies in the Church who offer the 1962 me missal in full communion are a living testament 
that the SSPX is in schism, that the SSPX is not a Catholic organization or institution, uh, because you, again, you, you can just see, because if they were, they would look like the fraternity of St. Peter. They would look like the Institute of Christ, the King, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, a side, a side uh, interesting historical note that many people may not understand or, or, or know, uh, the fraternity of, of St. Peter, the priests who left, were actually um, one of them, Father Joseph Bizig, uh, along with others, had been put in charge around the time of 1983. And I got this information from a fraternity priest who told me this. Um, they had been put in charge of a uh, commission of a group of, of researchers, of, of SSPX priests, who were supposed to study for the archbishop whether or not the, the act of consecrating a bishop against the will of a pope was a schismatic act. And these priests came back with the decision after studying the fathers and doctors of the church and the tradition that, yes, it is and did constitute a schismatic act. And five years later, in 1988, uh, the archbishop would go on to disregard the results of that commission that he himself had set up. And he went on to commit the schismatic act of, or of, of consecrating four bishops against the express will of the Pope. And of course, the, the priests who had done that study were the ones who left to found the fraternity of St. Peter. Uh, and just so people realize the gravity, the, the act of consecrating a bishop against the Pope's will constitutes an act of spiritual rape at the heart of the church. That is the gravity of that action. That's why it's so grave. It's a usurping of, 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 of a very close, uh, an intimate and very important power, um, one that's connected to every aspect of the church's life and taking that and, and in a violent way and then creating a kind of strife and confusion uh, that leads so many souls, souls astray. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Um, speaking of uh, Pope John Paul II, they have a particular disdain for Pope John Paul II, don't they? And they, if I'm not mistaken, they kind of reject all his writings, his teaching, his theology, and go even beyond that, don't they? Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, what it makes sense that they would because he truly was the Pope. He was a father. He was a father of the Second Vatican Council, and he was the Pope who would have the second longest reign of any pope in, in church history. And he would go on to implement the Second Vatican Council on every level of the church's life. Canon law, theology, catechisms, uh, you name it. Uh, it, it. He cemented the legacy of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, those traditionalists who, who, who want the Second Vatican Council to go the way of history and to be put in the dustbin, it's never going to happen because of John Paul II. It's another reason why they reject his canonization, um, because they truly believe that he was one of the most destructive popes in church history and that he even rejected Christ himself. As a matter of fact, um, Archbishop Lefebvre um, made two drawings, um, kind of cartoon-like uh, drawings. And uh, it, you can't find this on the internet, but it's in this book, um, Letters from the Rector. Of St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary, which is by Bishop Richard Williamson. Um, you can find this is available from True Restoration Press. Um, but Bishop Williamson was, was the uh, bishop, one of the four bishops consecrated by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. He was also the bishop who was expelled from the society in 2012 during the big split, during the discussions with Rome, right? And uh, in it, he, uh, he presents the two reproductions of, of these cartoons. And he says, um, the archbishop sent a letter to the Pope uh, together with this double picture um, and, uh, and that this letter shows that the double picture did come from the, the, what he, who he calls the sweet and gentle archbishop. Uh, and he presents a letter right here from the archbishop, which shows that these pictures were from him. And uh, the first picture is called is titled the Assisi Travesty, and you have the International Congress of Religions here, and uh, you have uh, Christ and the Blessed Mother and the Holy Spirit and the Father, and you have Pope John Paul II rejecting the Trinity and Mary, saying, "No, no, there's no room for you. You're not ecumenical." 
<laughs> in there rejecting the Blessed Virgin and the Holy Trinity. Which is and, a false uh, understanding of ecumenism for the record, people. It is. That's right. Ecumenism has to Shame do with the unity of Christian bodies, of, 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 of Christianity, of other Christians. And uh, there's in, interreligious dialogue. And of course, the misunderstand in, in, interreligious dialogue has to do with other religions. And of course, there's a conflation, though, and a misunderstanding by traditionalists and by the archbishop of these these different things. And they the misunderstanding of the Assisi um, uh, Congress uh, which was was very unfortunate. Um, and there were a lot of unfortunate things that happened that were outside of the pope's control. Um, but again, the, the the archbishop was just so scandalized by it, even though the, uh, the the pope was obviously not praying to false gods or rejecting christ i mean look at the whole life of john paul ii does he look like an apostate i mean it's ridiculous as a matter of fact and and especially the blessed mother he gave his whole pontificate his his episcopal and and and, and motto as a pope was totus tuus totally yours he gave himself completely to the um to the blessed mother and dedicated this papacy to her but um, here's the other one. I really like. Uh, I really like this one. This one is entitled "Apostasy?" Question mark. And it has um, uh, Christ here in the the gate of um, the gate of heaven, and it has uh, uh, Pope John Paul II approaching the gate, and he says, "I am John Paul II, the ecumenical pope." And Christ is saying, "I'm sorry. There's only one religion here. Go and look elsewhere." And you see two demons right here. If you can see those two demons in the corner who are whistling, one of them's whistling at him saying, hey, buddy, ecumenists this way for all the gods of the Gentiles are devils. So you see Christ. The most ridiculous him. thing. Yep. And ridiculous. The devil summoning him into hell. And he actually sent these drawings to the Pope himself. So now did let me ask you a quick question. Did um, is it true that Archbishop Lefebvre actually signed the documents of Vatican II before he rejected it? Did he sign off on all of that? He did. He signed every single one of them, yes. Which is crazy because he signed off on them and then went off to reject them. And then, so, which means that he either didn't read them or he's just later on, based off his own musings, misinterpreted them. I don't understand how you can misinterpret the writings of Vatican II on ecumenism, on evangelization, on the whole goal of it is to make the world Catholic, to bring people to Christ and to bring people to the one church. Yes. I don't know how you can misinterpret that except for maybe intentionally or I don't know. Yeah. I, I, well, I don't want to. I mean, the, the premise, what happens, I don't know if you, if, have you ever read Sherlock Holmes uh, yes. by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Okay. It's one of my favorites. I just love that one growing up. And uh, there's one, I don't know if you remember, I don't know, if, was it in a study in Scarlet where uh, they're, 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 he and Watson are driving in a carriage to a crime scene and, you know, Scotland Yard is, you know, the, the, who's taking them there, the, one of the gentlemen from Scotland Yard is trying to figure out and conjecture what it could be. And uh, the Sherlock Holmes is just talking about random things, you know, like the concert that he went to and he isn't even thinking about it. And Watson asks him, well, why aren't you? Why aren't you talking about the, the crime scene? And uh, Sherlock Holmes says, because I don't want to form any kind of preconception uh, of what the, what it could be or come up with my own views of, of what it could be uh, based off of, uh, you know, conjecture. I want the, the, the actual clues to lead me uh, and show me and, and not have my own understanding of, uh, of and, and what I think it could already be then looking at those clues and trying to fit them according to that theory or according to what I think that crime could actually be. And it's a classic thing that we, we humans have a tendency to do. We come up with an idea in our mind and then we come up with proofs to, to, to demonstrate what we want to believe. Uh, and, and so if you're actually trying reading the documents of second Vatican council in light of tradition, right. In light of the whole teaching of the Catholic Church, and even in the light of each other, right? In light of uh, they should be taken as a whole, uh, you will not come to these misconceptions uh, about the Second Vatican Council. No. And Archbishop Lefebvre himself acknowledged that repeatedly, in letter, both in letters to the Pope when he was drawing toward Rome, because he was 
he was his life was a constant vacillation of drawing away from Rome and calling them a bunch of antichrists, not wanting having them anything to do with them, and then drawing close to Rome, trying to seek recognition, and uh, and and then accepting all of the Second Vatican Council interpreted in light of tradition and the complete validity of the new mass, and that's why he produced in his priests um, what we called hardliners and softliners, which were those who were. Um, the, the hardliners, you might say, were almost state of a contest. You know, they were like really, um, they, they they held to the hardline statements of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in his writings. And the softliners were the ones that held to Archbishop's softer, you know, softer approach, more diplomatic approach to Rome. And this was what led to the major split in 2012, which was eventually what prompted me uh, to make my exit, uh, was because the these two uh, forces produced in the spiritual sons of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre came to a head and they split. And my uh, the Dominicans in Evrier, where I that I studied under and where I was a postulant, um, they actually sided with the resistance. Um, and Bishop Richard Williamson, who got expelled, and the priests of the, the new SSPX resistance. So I was like, okay, so we already were a resistance, right? The SSPX is already a resistance to Rome. Now we have a resistance to the resistance. Does this look familiar? <laughs> Yeah, does so in Sede Vicantism as well. Yes. Um, so very interesting, though, that I don't, yeah, you have to have an agenda or you really have to have, you know, justification for your movement to ignore the clear, uh, w- what the clarity, I and this is, sorry, I'm thinking of 10 thoughts at once, but when I talk to SSPX or when I talk to Sede Vicantis, most of them have not read the documents. You know, they have not read them. And if they have, it's only little clips of them not in context they'll say things like oh well you know the catholic church your catholic church teaches that you know muslims are going to heaven and they all worship the same god when in fact john paul ii also said that islam is not a religion of salvation because they reject jesus christ and his sacrifice on the cross he couldn't be more clear but they don't take that in context they just snip it the way protestants do and they just try to bash the church with it that's right that's exactly right and so again, remember my Sherlock Holmes analogy? So they're coming to the documents or to the quotes of Vatican II with the traditionalist worldview, with traditionalist glasses. And so, of course, they're going to use those those quotes and they're going to read what they believe into them instead of just coming from a totally unbiased perspective and reading them in the, in the context that they are meant to be read in. Uh, so that's yeah, that's exactly what 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 has what has happened, and it continues to happen to this day. Uh, and you get things like you get these these silly uh, open letter condemnations by these groups of traditionalist Catholics and bishops um, who are condemning the Pope uh, of heresy and and of actually contradicting uh, Vatican uh, actually co- contradicting the Council of Trent. So I guess Pope Francis recently made a statement that the only thing that you need to to approach a uh, communion is to have the garment of faith. And they said, well, that goes completely against what the, 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 the Council of Trent said, uh, which is that you have to not only have faith, but you also have to have repentance. Do we really think that Pope Francis meant that you don't have to have repentance? If you look at any of other of Pope Francis's writings, yes, of course you have to have repentance. We all have to have repentance. And he would have meant that. Um, and Michael Lofton uh, actually has pointed out, rightly so, in his um, video covering this subject, is that, well, you might as well condemn St. Paul, too, because St. Paul uh, didn't make the qualification either. And it was actually his writing that has been used by Protestants, right, when it comes to faith alone and that that's all you need. No, you have to interpret Paul in light of tradition, interpret him in in, in the proper context of the Catholic faith, not just cherry picking uh, these certain uh, verses from scripture, uh, but we see that the traditionalists, both within and without the church, are doing the exact same thing. Now, before we leave, uh, can I ask, I just have another couple quick questions. Um, in regard to Pope Francis trying to, um, I guess, remove the Latin Mass, for lack of a better word, suppress it. I mean, do SSPX, do St. David Contes, do traditional people who love the Latin Mass, do they have a concern, a right concern? I mean, do they have the right to be disobedient against that? Didn't Pope pa- popes in the past say that you can't remove the Latin Mass, you can't change it, and now Pope Francis is? So can we freely just disregard that? I mean, since Pope Francis is doing the wrong thing? Yeah, right. Uh, well, let's see. For starters, uh, uh, 
what, what was the first part of the question you said? Oh, suppression. So for yes. starters, uh, Pope Francis has not suppressed the the 1962 missile completely. That's a falsehood. And that's actually a projection um, by traditionalists uh, who are clinging really, really tightly uh, to um, this this missile. And, and again, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about faithful Catholics who have traditional leanings, um, uh, who, who are faithful to the, to, to the Pope and, and Rome, right? Many people say, when you say traditionalists, you know, you're talking about these good people. You're, you're actually referring to this poor little granny no. who just wants the Latin mass or these young people who <laughs> just want the Latin mass. You're going after them. No, when I'm saying traditionalists, I'm talking about somebody who rejects the Second Vatican Council, rejects, you know, the magisterium of the popes, has an, has hostility and rejects papal primacy That's and right. also puts their own interpretation of tradition over that of the magisterium, right? That's what I'm talking about when I refer to traditionalists. Just wanted to clarify that. So um, when these traditionalists say um, they've that, oh, see, he's, he's attacking the Latin mass and it's going to be totally gone. It's not not true. As a matter of fact, he has told all of the, uh, the fraternity of St. Peter, Institute of Christ the King, all of these uh, priestly societies who have been instituted for the sake of continuing the uh, 1962 missile, they have are completely permitted to use all of the 1962 sacraments. And so if I can just not, jump in for one second, um, the priest who officiated my my wedding, mine and my wife's wedding, he is part of the FSSP. And he told me the exact same thing. Yes, yes. So, so he has not, what he's done is he has suppressed uh, the, the growth of the um, 1962 right uh, and its celebration at the diocesan level. So he wants it to be a unified practice uh, instead of having say like two masses where, uh, and, and which can be very problematic because you have the, say a person, uh, people who go to an earlier mass, which is the 1962 right, and they that's their mass. And then you have the rest of the parish that goes to let's say a later mass and and the the mass of Vatican II, right? The um the new rite is their mass, and often you have then these two groups that sometimes divide and then don't really have anything to do with each other, right? And so you actually have this kind of separation uh, of Catholics at the the par- at the parochial level instead of all of them coming together and worshiping under the same rite of mass, which is a very important sign of communion and unity. Now, there can be diversity of rites, and the church has always allowed those diversity of rites, but we have to remember that this is within the Roman rite. This doesn't have to do with Eastern rites. This has to do with the practice of the Roman rite. And so naturally, if you have two forms of the Roman rite, you're going to have people say, well, why would you choose one over the other, right? Um, Probably because it, 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 it more often than not, it goes it goes further than just mere preference. It's, well, I think that this one is more perfect or this one is less perfect, right? And now you have this problematic situation um, where you even can have two rival altars. And, and that was actually a classic definition of schism. And so you have this unfortunate, um, that unfortunately that has this, this situation that has come about that didn't necessarily need to come about, but because of these traditionalist animators like Taylor Marshall and, um, you know, all of these of these prominent personalities who are fueling this despising and hatred toward the reforms of the Second Vatican Council and the Second Vatican Council. Now you have all of these people, even within the church, who are actually um, now hostile toward the new right, you know, and who actually openly criticize it, who, who, um, who tear it down. And and then and or or even if they don't, they at least say, well, ours is the more perfect form of the Roman right. And we this is the right that the church needs to return to. And we're going to keep promoting this right so that eventually the church will embrace this right again and and throw the the right uh, of of the second, you know, the second Vatican Council following the forms out the window. Right. This is the attitude that that Pope Francis is concerned about and that he wants to address because it's so important for us as Catholics to worship together to be one in mind and spirit. And that's actually way more important than uh, than, than uh, worshiping according to a certain year, right? Or a certain ritual practice. And uh, you, you brought up uh, popes in the past having suppressed rights. Um, as a matter of fact, Pope Francis actually explicitly referred uh, to the example of Pope St. Pius V, who suppressed uh, all of the rights that were um, all of the uh, in the Roman Church at the time, 
that were less than 200 years old. And uh, uh, so, so you can see that the Pope has this uh, authority, especially considering it's the Roman rite, it is the ritual expression of the Roman see, it is under the purview and under the authority of the, the popes to make changes over time, and they always have. And so it is completely within the authority uh, of the, the, the pope to abrogate a certain, the, the ritual practice of a certain year, and in this case, it's the 1962, and make reforms uh, into what would eventually become 1969. Now, were those were the reforms of the Second Vatican Council more comprehensive and 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 more extensive than any that had been seen before? Yes, but that was what the authority of the Church and the authority of the Pope, of Pope Paul VI, especially, uh, decided that the Church needed in our day and age. So, this our the 1969 right is the gift that the Catholic Church has given us for the. Uh, for how we are to worship together as Catholics. And for the um, record, moment, just I could hear all moment. of the hairs on the back of traditionalists standing up on the back of their necks and heads, but we're not talking about the monkey masses and the clown masses and the guitar masses. <laughs> and, and that is not the no. Novus Ordo. Those are abuses, uh, disgusting abuses of the Novus Ordo. We're talking the actual Vatican II Novus Ordo, That's which exactly still has right. Gregorian chant as the prime and the organ as the primary um, music. We st And parts are still in Latin and we didn't disregard everything. I mean, we're talking about what Vatican II actually wanted, not what many people said. Sorry. Yes. No, that's that you, that's exactly right, Brian. And 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 that's the point I'm making is that just as Pope uh Pope John the 23rd had the authority uh to make changes to the missal uh and move from the 1955 right, you know, to the or the 1958 right uh to um or I'm sorry, yes, the 1955 right to the night to the uh, 1962 right, uh, or even Pope uh, Pius the Twelfth made uh, really um, important uh, changes to the liturgy at Easter time as well, and that's why even many traditionalists today they do not like the Easter changes of the 1962 right, and they go with the uh, 1955 right or the pre 1955 right um, for those Easter changes. Right, you can see already. Traditionalists already are not agreeing on which year or which ritual practice is actually the most important, and some are even going back further. Um, so, but but it's also it's actually a proof that the popes have been making changes to the mass over time. But we still have the mass. The essential nature of the mass in the 1969 rite, the Mass of Vatican II, the Mass of Pope Paul VI, is the mass. And it actually did it. Did it remove certain elements that were that were good and beautiful? Sure, that was a decision that the church decided to make. Uh, but it also added in all kinds of new and important and be uh, beautiful additions, such as more more readings of scripture, especially the Old Testament, um, a, a greater simplicity, uh, not as much necessarily, not as much repetitions, which is actually a principle of the Roman Rite to try to move away from too many ritual gestures, uh, which is more uh, distinctive of Eastern liturgy, and to have something that's uh, more uh, a more kind of noble simplicity, right, in the spirit of Romanitas. So it pared down some of uh, some of the repetitions and the prayers and the gestures. Uh, there were all these different things that that make the rite. Very beautiful, and uh, and actually one of the most beautiful liturgies I've ever attended was when a priest as he sang almost the entire mass. Uh, that's not possible in the 1962 rite because the priest actually has to say it in a low voice. Um, uh, the the Roman canon is said in the low in a low voice, uh, but but in the past, <clears throat> excuse me, even the more almost the entire mass was more open to singing, more open to song. And the the new rite actually allows for this. So one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had was participating in a new rite where the consecration of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ was sung. I mean, hearing the priest sing those words infused a kind of power and meaning into them that just made my heart sing. It was just amazing. So you see, and, and th this is just one example of the beautiful elements of the Novus Ordo Rite, of the, of the 1969 Rite that we've been given, 
that are not being used, that are just waiting to be used. If we were to fully implement the right of, of, the, of, of the Second Vatican Council as the church desires us to do, we, you would be amazed at the, 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 the beauty and the, and the goodness and the truth that would be experienced. And I, and I want to point out that we're not against the Latin Mass. In fact, I love the Latin Mass. I love its beauty. I love its power. I love its transcendence. I love a lot of aspects about it. Um, there are other things I don't necessarily like about it, but I do like it a lot. And I'm, um, we're not advocating that, oh, well, you know, that one is better than the other. Oh, you have to go with the Novus Ordo. The only thing we're trying to, uh, push across here is that, the mass has been changed so many times down through the centuries, despite the constant redundant myth that the that Jesus started the Latin mass and it hasn't changed since the, the year 33 AD. <laughs> I mean, that's just nonsense. But but the point is that Catholic Church's authority has changed the liturgy and has the authority to do so. And when, as you said, when we get too caught up in liking a specific little t traditions of something, we come to a head when, in fact, when 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 Pope uh, Francis started talking about these things and suppressing the Latin Mass, so called. People are saying, oh, maybe we should go to Greek Orthodox now, or maybe we should go to SSPX. They're literally talking about leaving the one true church of Jesus Christ and putting their souls in, in jeopardy of eternal damnation yes. over the fact that these little traditions, which they love and want to hold on to, understandably, they yeah. do not supersede the authority of the church. And I think that's a super important point that needs to be made. Otherwise, it's just Protestantism all over or Orthodox all that's over. That's right. You're absolutely right, Brian. Um, we we will be damned or saved based off of how we accept the authority of the church, right? Or how we, which at the pinnacle of that authority is, is the Holy Father, is the Roman pontiff. Uh, but we will not be damned or saved based off of the, the kind of ritual expression or, or, or a certain year of mass. Um, so it would be, it's, it's actually the, the fact that they have put the, um, the practice, the celebration or the preservation of the 1962 rite of mass above obedience to the Roman primacy shows that they've made a fundamental error in the hierarchy of truths. Um, Absolutely. 100 percent 100 percent um we've gone a long time <laughs> i'm not sure if you have to go but I, I also know you may have had some more i just want to give you the opportunity to say anything that you wanted to say that i didn't ask about or that i might have missed or you think might be important if you have anything at all maybe we covered it all no no i thought i think we we covered a a good yeah a good amount um i mean this this issue, of course, is very extensive. There's a lot of yeah, a lot of details, a lot of things you can talk about. And I'd love to pick it up in the future at some point. You know, I love what you have to say, and I love the work that you're doing. And maybe you can actually, on that point, maybe you can share with people where they can find you, um, the video you did, or articles you've written, and so on. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, the first, the first, my first debut onto the scene, you might say, was the article, uh, the open letter that I writ, wrote to a fellow member of my Dominican order uh, on Catholic World Report. Uh, it's called Why I Left the, uh, the Society of St. Pius X. Uh, it gives a little bit of the uh, chronology of my journey and some of the, the issues that I stumbled across and my reasons for leaving. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And, uh, and then I'm currently working uh, with uh, Dom Dalmaso and uh, John Salza over at the Logos Project. Uh, which you can find on YouTube and uh, and the various social media platforms, and we have recently um, created uh, what we call the Contra Tratum series, uh, in which we get into these issues, uh, and we've covered the the history of the SSPX from its uh, beginning and conception and eventual suppression uh, all the way until the present and. And we've covered things like that's um, something schism. I would love to do a whole show on here in the yeah, future. Schism. That's we've very interesting. Things like schism and the errors of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, because not only was he schismatic, but he was he actually also rejected uh, the pap papal primacy, the dogma of papal primacy, in his words and actions, as well as other essential uh, doctrines on uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and we get into that in our Contra Tratum series. So please 
uh, definitely, if you're interested in this topic and want a little bit more clarity uh, and uh, and clear the waters of, of mud around this issue, please, please check out our work at the Logos Project. Amen to all of that. And we will link those down below for you uh, so that people can see them and check them out. And I want to thank you for coming on our show today. It's been an utter pleasure to have the truth being told that it actually feels like a breath of fresh air. We don't have to do jumping jacks. We don't have to do gymnastics or, you know, we don't have to bend around anything. We just got to present the church's teaching and it actually is a breath of fresh air. That's so right. I want to thank you for coming on. We just have to be faithful to the church, trust the church, you know, trust the papacy, trust in the promises of Christ that he will be with us to the end of time. Uh, that, I mean, the, 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 the Pope uh, and the authority of the church is the bedrock on which the church the church rests. Uh, it is, he speaks through the authority of Christ. He who hears you, hears me. So let's continue. Let's continue to trust, trust the church and, uh, and not, and not, uh, not leave her, uh, to the outside where we can become prey to the wolves. Amen. And on that note, I want to thank everybody else for tuning in and thank you for joining us on our Catholic Truth podcast. Please check out uh, Andrew Bartel's uh, notes down below and please follow us down below as well if you would like to follow us on Facebook or uh, LinkedIn or uh, you name it, Instagram, TikTok, our podcast, anything else. It's all down there. If you would like to support our ministry so we can continue bringing the truth to the world, even the controversial truth, please check out our PayPal and our Patreon down below. And please keep praying for us. Pray for this video. Please pray for all the people it's going to reach. And please pray that souls continue to come home to Jesus Christ in his, the fullness of his church. God bless you all. And we will see you next time.